Good morning, Duck Church. How's everyone this morning? Oh, it's rainy out. How's everyone this morning? All right, let's stand and worship the Lord.
So this, this goes out to Amy because last week she didn't have a voice and she was cheering at the track tournament, the, the state tournament, which the girls finished in second and we had a cross country racer finish in first. It's awesome. So in Philippians 2 verse 16, it says, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, that my work was not useless. You know, the most important part of the race is the finish line. Yes, the start's important, but you can have a bad start and finish and still finish well. However, if you finish badly, it doesn't matter how well you started. You're simply tired and it was all for nothing. Finishing is everything. In Acts 20, the Apostle Paul talked about finishing the race of life well. He said, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. You know, when we're young, we may think that we're just starting our race, but we really don't know how long our lives will be. That's why we wanna run the race of life well. And the object is to finish well too. For the Christian, the race is not a sprint, it's a long distance run. As Hebrews 12 verse one encourages us. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So here's how to run the race well and finish it well. Run it for Jesus. Don't run it for people. Don't run it for mere duty. You have an audience of one. Jesus Christ himself is watching you. So run for him. Don't just start the race well, finish it well, and finish it with joy. Let's all stand and sing, lead me to the cross.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Duck Church. Uh, as we enter this holy sanctuary, we invite you to leave the cares of the world behind and to enter into the presence of God. As we begin our time this morning, a couple of things I want to call to your attention. Today is the last day that you can order a pie for Thanksgiving from the Duck Methodist Women. Uh, the proceeds from uh, this sale will go to support local missions, so you can feel good about investing in that and getting a great pie in, in the process. Also in your uh, bulletin is the covenant card for uh, giving for next year. And uh, if you remember to bring yours from last week, great. If you didn't, there's one in your bulletin for this week. And if you need more time to uh, remember what it was you put down on the one that you left at home, we'll take it next week, I promise you. Um, but do prayerfully consider what your support for um, your giving next year will be because we want to be faithful to carry out the ministry and the mission that we believe God has called us to accomplish. And uh, your financial support enables us to do that. Also, you will find a connection card. And if you would take a moment to sign in on the card and complete as much information on the front of that card as you feel comfortable in sharing, it does help us to get to know you a little bit. And we would like to do that. And uh, if you're with us for the first time, welcome to you. And uh, if you would check that box that says first time guest, that would be great. Now, over on the other side of the card, there are some next steps that are designed to help us to put our faith into practice. And so we've got some practical steps that we'll talk about at the conclusion of the message this morning. And we'll give you time a little bit later in the service to finish up anything that you need to with your connection card before we receive them at the end of the service. So <clears throat> this morning we're finishing up uh, a series that's really been focusing on sacrifice. And today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11, and the message is the gain, the gain of sacrifice. I came across something in my reading this past week that I want to share with you, and this is it. Nothing of spiritual significance comes without sacrifice. Your spirituality will always be measured by the size of your sacrifice. So let's continue to learn about uh, sacrifice as uh, we continue our time of worship this morning and we want to uh, spend this time in prayer to the Lord and I have some prayer concerns that I'd like for us to pray about together not only today but this week um, so we want to lift up uh, Lois and Rich Green and Gail Harris and Joel and Ann Billingsley uh, Alex and Ingrid uh, John Beaufort, there are two unspoken requests, and uh, let's remember Gwen Botson and her family. Are there others that we should pray for together? Anyone else? Yes. How, Luke, and Kelly? And Isla. And Isla, okay. How, Luke, Kelly, and Isla. Yes. Kaylee. Yes, ma'am. The Grinnan family and also Tommy and Sheila Grandy. Grinnan family and Tommy and Sheila Grandy. Go ahead. Bev, Chris, and Eli. Bev, Chris, and Eli. Tony and Susan. Yes, ma'am. Paul Parker and Mickey Clark. Okay, Paul and Mickey. Thank you. Yes. Prayer of thanksgiving for all of our veterans. Anyone else? Yes. Gaza, yes. 
Gaza, Israel, Ukraine. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's go before the Lord as we pray. Father, we are so grateful that in these moments as we come to you in prayer that you incline your ear to hear our prayers. We, we don't deserve your attention. And yet, in your grace, you hear us and you answer us according to your perfect character. Father, you are gracious and righteous and merciful. And because of that, we can call on our souls to rest in you. And you have been so gracious, so bountiful to each of us. You have answered our pleas for mercy and you've given us new life in Jesus Christ. And so we rest in you because you never change. And Lord, in this moment, we just want to thank you for the gift of prayer. Thank you that you have made a way for us to call upon your great name. And you have invited us to pray at all times and to pray all kinds of prayers. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words when we're too weak to pray. And we thank you for giving us prayer when we don't know what to do or where to go. When we're lost or confused or overwhelmed, we know that we can always pray. And Lord, in the light of these truths, we ask that you would help us to be people who are marked by prayer. Cause us to be quick to remember you every moment, not only when things are super hard. Help us to remember you and pray to you in every triumph and in every trial, in every joy and sadness, really in every season of life. And in faithfulness today, we pray for those who are struggling and who need your help. We lift up those that we have mentioned aloud and those that we treasure in our hearts. We thank you for veterans all across this country who have faithfully sacrificed and served our country with bravery and distinction. Bless them and their families as well. And please draw near to those who need your healing and your comfort and your strength. Lord, we ask all of this with thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we have been involved here at Duck Church with uh, Zoe Empowerment Ministry for a number of years now. And this morning we have the privilege of seeing the impact that your generosity has made on David's life and the life of his two sisters. So let's give attention to the screens for a moment. My name is David. I am 22 years old. I provide for my two sisters. I belong to Muhuza Group, partnered with the Dark Church. I have completed two years with the Zoe program. Welcome to our home. Before joining the Zoe program, David and his sisters were very poor. They used to doing labor for food. All of them dropped out of school because of extreme poverty. Their home was very old. They could not afford adequate clothes. Their neighbors stigmatized them and treated them like they had no value. They were hopeless and they never attended church. With Zoe, David received a grant for creating a small income project. Now he has three businesses. His initial project is a bicycle taxi service. His second project is selling food crops. Today he has cassava. And his third project is breeding and selling guinea pigs and chickens. Furthermore, they made a dish rack. They repaired their entire house by setting new roof and ceiling, plastering the walls and applying local paintings inside, and they constructed a latrine. Also, 
David is building a commercial house. Because of the empowerment, David transformed his household's life in an amazing way. Today, their meals improved where they eat two or three meals a day. They always ensure that their meals are nutritious by including all kinds of food values. One sister resumed her schooling. They all became socially integrated in the community and now they are good Christian children and they joined their church youth choir. We are so grateful to you, dear our parents and friends from Dark Church. We really do appreciate your kindness to support us in changing our life. Thank you again for reaching out to my family. We love you the best. Zoe, uh, yes. <clears throat> I'm always fond of saying that Zoe changes lives, and it does. And, you know, David... His name in Hebrew happens to mean beloved. And it's just a reminder that people like David and his sisters, they mean something to God and they mean something to us. They are beloved and they view us as their parents. Um, you know, most of these orphans that we support became orphans because of the AIDS pandemic that just ravaged their country. Uh, we're focused on Rwanda. And uh, every year we pledge and we meet uh, supporting 225 orphans. And we've done that for a number of years now. In front of you, in your pew, there's a little colorful card. It may not be yellow, it may be another color. But if it's uh, something that you would like to be a part of, you can support a Zoe Orphan. It's a three-year empowerment program that teaches these orphans how to be self-sufficient, how to start a business, how to care for their family. And, you know, most of these... Uh, these people are caring for younger siblings. They have had to step up and be the parents. And they've gone from stealing food to providing for their family because of our financial support. So uh, it's $360 for the three years. And uh, you can pay that in, in installments. But we're coming to the end of the year. We do need it before uh, the end of December in order to make that uh, commitment. So uh, if, it's not, if it's too much for you, maybe you can partner with a friend or two and support uh, an orphan in that way. Maybe your small group can take that on as a project. I just want to make sure that we're always able to take care of the 225 that we've pledged to do every year. So thank you for your, your prayerful consideration of that ministry. So as we turn our attention now to Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11, I want to say that I believe with all my heart that this is the Holy Spirit inspired word of God and it is God's word of hope for us and for all of humanity who will heed it. And so let's be attentive as God's word is read this morning so that we might apply it to our lives and discover all that God has for us this morning. Would you pray with me? Oh God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As the scriptures are read, we will listen for your voice. By your spirit, lead us out of our fears and into the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our souls. Amen. Listen for the word of God. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. 
And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's something that happens when we meet Jesus for the first time. As we continue to meet Jesus and continue to be transformed by a living encounter with the person of Jesus and life in his church. This encounter transforms our values. It transforms what's important to us. It transforms what we are passionate about. Some things that we really had to have and couldn't live without, suddenly they're not important anymore. Everything has been reassessed. Everything has been revalued. Our life has been reprioritized. Paul is trying to tell us what is happening in his life and what is supposed to happen in every believer's life in Philippians chapter 3. And this is a very powerful passage on what happens when Jesus gets a hold of our life and begins changing us from the inside out. A lot of times we hear in the Christian life that we're supposed to sacrifice. Sacrificing, though, is about giving up. Sacrifice is about losing things. I mean, you can't sacrifice without losing some things. But sometimes if we're living a life of sacrifice without the powerful encounter of Jesus Christ, it looks like this. A big man trying to take away a bone from a scrappy little dog. Next slide, please. There you go. So God is the big man and we're the little dog. And the bone is whatever it is that we have. Our pride, our anger, our jealousy, our sense of self-worth in ourselves. That's the bone that we don't want to give up. And God says, drop it. Drop it. Jesus used a different picture. He said it was like a man walking through a field and he stumbles upon this unbelievable treasure, more than he ever could imagine, a life better than he could have ever dreamed of. And so he goes back and he sells everything he has and he sacrifices everything so that he can buy that field and get that treasure. That's what the Christian life is like. That is what encountering Jesus means and that, that's what Paul is going to explore today. So through his own story, he's going to show us what every Christian's journey is meant to be. A life of losing but also a life of gaining the thing that is of supreme worth, the treasure, the the pearl of great price. And that's what this passage is all about. So Paul comes out swinging in verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. And you might be thinking, whoa, this guy is really angry. Well, he's not so much angry, but he says that we need to keep our focus on the heart of the Christian faith. If you cut this out, if you somehow compromise this, you've lost the heart of faith in Jesus. And so this is something that is worth fighting for, Paul says. And then he moves into a personal testimony. Now, before Paul met Jesus, his life was pretty good, at least his self-assessment of his life. Now, he was running around killing Christians, but aside from that, his life was pretty good and he felt pretty good about himself. He has has good self-esteem. 
And then he met Jesus. And it was traumatic. I was knocked down. I was blind. I couldn't see or eat for three days. I was completely disoriented. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know which way was up. And then this guy I had never met came and laid hands on me and prayed. And it was like scales falling off my eyes. And I'm like, what just happened? It was traumatic. And since he's come to know Jesus, it's really hard. And he's like, I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been beaten. I've been threatened. And now I'm in a prison cell and I don't know whether I'm getting out alive or dead. So come follow Jesus with me. This is my testimony. And notice what Paul does in verses five and six. There are seven things and they're all very impressive. Paul is giving us his spiritual life resume. And there are two categories on this life resume status and achievement. Now, status is the things you're born into. It's your privilege. And maybe you were born into wealth, or maybe you were born into a great home life, and it was just amazing. Or maybe you have beauty or talent or some kind of privilege. That's status. And then secondly, there's achievement. And achievement is what you earn. It's what you work for. It is you deserving what you get. And Paul said, I had both. I had privilege. I had achievement. I had status. I had spiritual success. And he says, if anyone could put together a good resume, it was me. I was confident in my own effort. And he uses that phrase three times. Confidence in our human effort. Paul is saying, I had confidence in what I was able to put together for my life before God and other people. I didn't feel like my life was a train wreck. And he says that it, it gave him a lot of significance and it gave him a sense of identity. And then Jesus bumped into his life and boom, everything is ripped out from underneath him. And notice what he says in verse seven. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. You remember that treasure that the guy bumped into in the field? Paul is saying, I found the pearl of great price. And then he goes on speaking of Jesus and he says, For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Now what does he mean by I discarded everything? Because he didn't lose his Jewish identity. He didn't lose how he was born or when he was circumcised. Well, he, he literally did lose one thing. He lost persecuting Christians. He completely gave that up. But the rest of that stuff, he said, it's more like stuff that just doesn't matter anymore. All that stuff that I thought was so important, all that stuff that I thought that I couldn't live without, it doesn't matter to me anymore. You know, some people call this the Rocky Balboa test. And if you're familiar with the Rocky movies, in Rocky 1, you know, Rocky is this scrappy uh, boxer from Philly and he wants to box and his wife, Adrian, doesn't want him to and she's trying to get him to quit. And at one point in the movie, she says, why is this so important to you? Why do you have to box? And he said, because if I don't fight, I'm just a bum. I'm nothing but a bum. So the Rocky Balboa test is what you would put in the blank in that sentence. If I don't have X, I'm just a bum. If I don't have my image of being a nice person, I'm a bum. If I'm not a perfect parent, I'm a bum. If my kids aren't successful, I'm a bum. If my life falls apart and I'm really struggling, I'm a bum. If I don't get that degree, I'm a bum. What would you put in that line? Paul said, I had a whole bunch of stuff in there. I thought I'd be a bum without it, and I'm not. I'm actually free. Whatever things were lost, it's like gain to me. Now, the New Living Translation, it says worthless, but other versions use the word garbage in verse 8. Now, that word, <laughs> that word that's used here is a very emotional word. It's not like leftover salad that you throw out with the trash. It means dung. It means excrement. I'm trying to use polite words in conversation here. 
One of the premier New Testament Greek scholars, a guy named Daniel B. Wallace, says this. The word in the Greek, the original word, took on the nuance of a vulgar expression with emotive connotations. Now that sounds like a scholar, doesn't it? In other words, it's disgusting. This is not a word that you would ever use in polite conversation. And it's why this word is actually so very rare in all of Greek literature, not just the New Testament. Paul is saying, you know that Nobel Peace Prize, that that Pulitzer, that MVP from the Super Bowl, that PhD from Harvard, or whatever way you measure success, it's all dung. And why would Paul say that? I mean, those things are not bad in themselves. I wouldn't mind getting a Pulitzer Prize someday. I wouldn't mind getting an honorary degree from Harvard or something like that. The point is, Paul was using them to build his righteousness project. And they were keeping him from the real treasure, which is Jesus. And that's why he said, they're like dung, just throw it out. You see, building your own righteousness is a hopeless project, according to the Bible. And we all think we can do it. I mean, we all think maybe a lot of people can't do it, but I can do it. And that's the default of our heart. I can build my righteousness. A former mayor of New York City was interviewed and he was talking about all of his political achievements and he said, I did this and I did that and blah, 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 blah. And at the end of his interview, he said this, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping for an interview. I'm heading straight in because I've earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. Now, I don't wanna say that that's just arrogant, but what's really wrong with that is it's ludicrous. That's the problem with it. It's like me saying, if anybody can beat LeBron James in one-on-one -on -one basketball, it's me. It wouldn't even be close. It's arrogant, but it's also ridiculous. One of the Psalms says in a beautiful summary statement of our human condition, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? And that's one thing we all have in common in this church and outside this church. If the Lord counted sins, and he does, who could stand before him? We're all sunk. None of us could succeed in this righteousness building project. But notice at the end of verse eight in the first part of verse nine, because here's where the good news comes in. Verse nine, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I love that phrase I thought about it all last week it's like it's like you're being held it's like you're being clothed in Jesus's righteousness and Paul goes on to say I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law I've given up on that project and I'm so glad I gave up on that he said rather I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on on faith. Now, earlier Christians would call that an alien righteousness. Not because it was something from outer space, but it may well, as well have been because it has nothing to do with you and it has nothing to do with your track record. It comes from God through Jesus Christ and you receive it by faith. You don't achieve it. It's not your status. It's not your pedigree. It's not your privileges. It's not how hard you've worked. Faith is a vessel by which God pours it into you. And faith is not a work. It's how we receive the gift. And Paul says, I have that now. And it totally reorient, reorients his life. And notice what he says in verse 10. Here's his new consuming passion. I want to know Christ. That's it. I'm not building my righteousness project I just want to know Jesus. I want to know this treasure. I want to know this one who has given me his righteousness. And Paul says there's two facets to knowing Jesus. First is the power of his resurrection. And second is to share in his sufferings. 
It's the Lord's resurrection. It's not our power and our effort. Christ puts within us as we encounter him, as we come to know him, the power of his resurrection. I mean, think of Jesus dead in the grave. Every cell in his body is dead. And then the power of God comes, reverses every single cell in his body, walks it backward, and all of a sudden, Jesus is alive. And that power, Paul says, is in you. I want you to know the power of his resurrection. I want you to experience that. So listen to me, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter how you've fallen flat on your face, no matter what train wreck you may be experiencing in your life right now, no matter how much you're hurting yourself or somebody else, or no matter what kind of dead end you feel like you're at, there is no dead end. There's the power of the resurrection. Paul says, I want to suffer with him. I want to know that too. But notice again, it's Christ's sufferings that Paul wants to know. Paul says, I want to press into sharing the sufferings of Jesus. Now, we're not likely to stand and cheer and go, hooray. But what does it mean? It means that we will never suffer alone. The worst thing about suffering is that we feel like we're alone in it. And we feel like people are going to reject us and that people are going to leave us and people are not going to understand. And so we go into this dark valley, whether it's depression or loneliness, addiction, divorce, whatever it is, we go into this valley and we're going there to be alone. Jesus says, no, it's my sufferings. I'm already there. You're coming into my sufferings. You're not suffering alone. I'm there with you. And Paul says, I want to press into that. That encounter with Jesus unleashes something into Paul. He's like a man being shot out of a cannon. Or C.S. Lewis said, it's like a horse growing wings. We begin to fly and do things that we never thought possible because the power of Christ is in us. And so Paul, even in this very broken place, remember he's in prison. He throws himself wide open to risk, to sacrifice, to give of himself because he knows the surpassing value of Christ. When everything is stripped away and one day it will be, all that stuff that we think is important, there's one thing for those who believe in Jesus, that will remain. And that is the supreme worth of knowing Christ. And I want us to recapture that this morning, to recapture the wonder of knowing Jesus. Maybe your life is a train wreck. Or maybe you feel pretty good about your spiritual resume right now. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but it's gotten stale. Maybe you need to come to Jesus for the first time. Wherever you are this morning, this message is for all of us. Christ himself is our treasure. How would you live? How, how, how would you live? How would you approach each day? How would you approach today? if you knew that Jesus is our supreme treasure. Reach out to Jesus today. Reach out to him in prayer. Don't let anything or anyone stand in the way of that. Reach out to Jesus for he alone is our treasure. Amen? So in just a moment, in response to God's word and his faithfulness to us, we're going to worship him by receiving the offering. So I'd like everyone to consider what your next step will be this week. Uh, please prayerfully consider what that step will be so that we can live obedient and sacrificial lives. Now, giving an offering may not seem like an act of worship to you, but it is because it's a way of voluntarily saying, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm, I'm dependent upon you, not upon my own efforts, my own 
ingenuity, my own intellect. I'm trusting you. And so uh, if you're with us for the first time today, we have a gift for you and we're glad that you have worshiped with us. It's a little book called How Good is Good Enough and it's written by Andy Stanley. And it's all about how to know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day. We want you to be certain about that. So all you need to do is drop your completed connection card in the offering plate when it's passed in just a moment. And then when you're leaving today, on the right side on the back wall, there's a table that's filled with copies of this book and they're there for you. So please feel free to pick one up and take it home and read it. It's our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us. And if you're already a member of Duck Church and you never got a copy, I want you to feel free to pick one up as well. God tells us over and over in the Bible not to be afraid. I think it's the most often repeated command, fear not. Our, our gifts this morning are one way that we trust God even in a world that tells us to be afraid. So we let go of thinking that we're on our own and live each day in graceful dependence upon God. So let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God with gratitude and praise. So for our offering song this morning, we're going to do a throwback. So imagine yourself 20 years ago. Um, and if you'd like to sing along with us, feel free. The lyrics are going to be on the screen um, in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
Let's all stand and sing Christ be made.
friends, next Sunday, we're going to be looking forward to Thanksgiving. And so the scripture focus next week will be 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 9 and 10. And the message will be proactive appreciation. I hope that you'll be here and I hope you'll invite a friend to come and worship with you. And now let's receive this blessing. Go now in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. Press on toward the ultimate prize of being one with Jesus. And may God's perfect word revive your soul. May Jesus be your rock. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you to press ever onward. Amen.